Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this session, Lightning Events and Methods, a guide to component communication. First off, thank you for coming out. I know it's after lunch. We're all ready for, uh, to sit back and relax a little bit. Um, hopefully, this session will be a good one where you can digest some really good information, take it back, and improve your Lightning component development for you. First off, forward-looking statement. Always buy your uh, purchase stock and other investments under what's currently available and not under any future functionality. That being said, everything that we'll talk about today is current functionality. All right. When you get a new project, you're gonna, it kind of feels like a green field to you. You come on and you say, hey, I'm here. I need to get to those far mountains. I got a river crossing. I got a forest. I'll be all right. I can get there. The problem that comes when you get down into the weeds. You gotta figure out how do I make this component interact with the other components on the page, be a good citizen in the lightning environment. You come up with all sorts of decisions. Do I use data binding? Do I use events? Do I use methods? If I use data binding, what type of data binding? Bound or unbound expressions, things like that. What we're gonna talk about today is, first of all, understanding our toolbox. What are the ways that we can talk between components and do it securely? When should we use each of those? And then how does that interact at scale? To do this, let's first take a look at the toolbox. OK, first tool in the toolbox, the one we all know and love, is data binding. You got bound and unbound expressions. This is our default whenever we say, hey, a component needs information, right? You're passing simpler complex values back and forth. You've got something called a, or a method. Methods are when a parent component comes and invokes a controller method on a child. You've exposed it to the public and said, this is accessible to anybody that wants to do it. You can pass parameters, you can pass functional parameters and callbacks in these, um, all sorts of different things with our methods. The last way that a parent can talk to a child is through an application event in the default phase. Here, again, you're executing that controller logic but it's not bound to a specific call. It's got a listener on the child component that says, hey, whenever I hear this, I'm going to perform an action. That's it. Three ways, parent to child, children. You don't have any other options. When it comes to child to parent, again, we see our old friend, two-way data binding. Um, the, as we said, you've got change listeners on both sides that are keeping that data in sync and it'll automatically re-render the components when any of those values change. The second method is events. Two flavors, application and component. You can pass data using event attributes, and it, um, you know, this is really the preferred method for any child-to-parent component communication, because the only other option is that data binding. And one thing to note about events is that they traverse something called the ownership hierarchy. It's not what you're contained in, it's who defined you, who said you should be created. Um, and that's the hierarchy that it flows up. We'll show a little bit of that in a minute, okay? I don't really like to stand up here and talk, I like to code. So we're gonna show some code. I've got a component that's a dynamic lookup component. Think of it like any of your other lightning input methods, except for this one is, uh, is custom built that we use all the time, okay? here's the redacted structure. It's got all sorts of other features. You'll have access to the entire component on the GitHub repo that I'll give you later. Um, so you can take it, use it, improve it, send me a pull request when you fix some bugs that I haven't found yet. So what you find on here is basically you've got an input label, type some text. You have a couple of options that show up in an autocomplete. You can select it and it saves it to the page. Let's take a look at how data binding is used in this component. So remember, you have two flavors, bound expressions and unbound expressions. Unbound expressions are a way for you to improve performance because it, it passes the data and stops listening. It does it one time. Um, typically, we're going to use these for very specific purposes on the page, um, and can, this can drastically increase your performance. Okay. And then we'll also look at a use case where we use um, functional parameter types, the ARA function or the uh, um, controller methods. Okay? So first off, bound expressions. You can see here inside of our component, we've got another component, a lightning input. 
I can't reach in and touch that component's attributes, but I can if I double bind it. So you can see right there, I've got the uh, value attribute double bound to the search string, which is local. You can also see I do the same thing with the R iteration. I double bind it with my resor results list. Okay? One thing to note, and this is where we'll talk about that ownership hierarchy. You'll see later on that the dynamic lookup component is owned by my, the dynamic lookup item is owned by the dynamic lookup, not by the iteration. Even though it's contained in that iteration, the iteration won't get any of those events. In this case, it's not a big deal, but when you're doing nests of your own custom components, watch out for that. It's a pretty big gotcha. Okay? Let's look at unbound expressions. Like I said, typically we do these for iterations. We, um, if you look, I've single bound that item value onto the dynamic lookup item. Okay? The, those items are refreshed, destroyed, and recreated every time the results list changes. There's absolutely no reason I have to spend the extra few milliseconds to set up listeners on every single one of those elements. You're wasting time on <laughs> processor power. So it's a way to improve that performance. The other, you can use it on things like a label. It's static. It's not likely to change. Go ahead and leave it there. Okay. Oh. Next, actions and functions. A word of warning when you're using actions and functions as a data bound value. Only use it on callbacks when you're invoking an OR method and on controller functions, on clicks, on changes. If you use it in other situations, the binding gets really, really wonky. Okay? All right. Let's take a look at methods. When should I use a method? So first off, a method, you're exposing code outside of your scope. This is great. Locker service says you can only play in your own scope, in your own component. What methods do, it allows other people to cause um, interaction on your component to occur. The other thing is if you have a lot of components. I've seen components where you've got 15 or 20 data bound values, and most of those are for setup. Another good option is to use a method and have the parent init that component and hand it all of the information because then it doesn't have to do any of the binding or keep control of it, okay? Let's take a look at that in action. So here, first one we're gonna do is the focus method. Lightning input, it has a method published called focus, which puts the cursor inside that box. Well, I wanna be able to do that in my component as well. So what I do is I create the Aura method that defines that focus, hits my controller, and I simply pass that method call through. I'm going to go find the component that I know exists and call its focus method. Another example of this is the reset. Now, we talked about wanting to keep attributes scoped closely. Well, my, at my, in my component, I need a search string. I need results but my parent component should never care about that. All they want to know is who my value is. So instead of binding those and having to clear them or having to have a change listener on the value that says, if the value changes to null, then do something, um, I can have a method that simply says reset. And it takes care of all of that logic, encapsulates all of that logic within my current component, and the parent just knows it, that hey, I called this method and it does what I want to do. It's a black box, okay? We're going to skip the application event for a second and we're going to talk about child to parent communication. So data binding, again, general purpose. That inner lightning input has the actual text value. We're binding that up into our search string attribute so that we can reuse it. The next segment, application and component events. Okay, you've probably heard some of these guidelines before, but it's good to reiterate them. Uh, whenever you can, use a component event. If you have to, then use an application event. Application events are a little bit more heavy. They include the default phase where I gotta go tell everyone below me that this event occurred. Remember what we talked about about the ownership hierarchy. It's who defined you. Um, the last thing is make sure to, in, to control your propagation. 
events continue to occur until they either hit the root or you stop the propagation or default phase. This means your event could cause something unexpected to happen unless you properly scope it. The last best practice on here is actually to scope those. So if I have a specific event like, I don't know, item selected, I can scope that and say, I'm capturing the, the item selected event, and I'm going to republish a more general event. Hey, data changed. That's something that the broader community can all listen for, and they get the information, even though they don't have to handle my selected event and someone else's click event and another component's on change event. So it's a way to be a good citizen and having just a few set attributes that can publish everywhere. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look. So here, my dynamic lookup item, I register that event. I, I get it and fire it in the child, in the parent. It bubbles up to me. I can do all sorts of things. I can handle it and stop the propagation. I can actually add information to it. The lookup item doesn't actually know the name of the form element that I'm using, but my parent component does. So I'm going to add that to that event so that anyone up the chain from me also gets that piece of information as well. Here, I'm intentionally not stopping the propagation because I want to address a specific use case. How many of you have been, have been asked, when I set this lookup, I also want the use, I've got a lookup for a product. When I select a product, I want the unit price to appear in the next column. How many of you have gotten that requirement before? It happens all the time. Well, instead of requeering for it, I'm just going to allow that event to continue to propagate up. And I include the record on my, on my event so that that data is available. Now the parent can handle it and say, oh, look, this item was selected. Here's the additional data. Let me just go ahead and set that information now. OK? All right. So we've looked a lot at this lookup component. For the application event default phase, parent to child communication, we're going to switch gears a little bit and look at a file manager component. OK, the default phase. You use application events when you need to talk to siblings, when you need to talk to other components. Use it in the app builder. Use it in highly nested structures. If you have a highly nested structure, you're going to have a whole mess of code trying to get to every level of that. You've got to loop through and say, do I have any children? Do I have any children? Do I have any children? You might have to pass a bunch of values through if you're using data binding and end up with one of those 27 attribute components. The one clause is make sure you're controlling the propagation. So let's take a look. So here's the tree node component. I have an on-click handler that says when I click it, expand it or collapse it. And inside, I've got my nested tree node. I'm going to be looping through all of these to build it all. Now, I don't want to pass a bunch of elements to say, is the current element expanded or collapsed? I don't want to have to loop through each of these objects and say, make sure to collapse all your children, and then make sure they collapse all of their children and recursively go through that. Instead, what I do is I'm going to register an application event. When I click that expand or collapse, it calls the toggle expanded method and fires that, changes the value and fires that event. Then I have a handler that says, when I hear that event, go ahead and collapse the node. All right? Now, there's one problem with this. Anywhere that I click on the entire page, it's going to collapse all on the entire component hierarchy. It's going to collapse them all because that event fires up, propagates up to the root node of the page, and tells everyone on the entire page to collapse. That's not the, what I wanted at all. Let's look at propagation. Propagation has three phases. First, the capture phase. When I click, all that the computer knows is the XY position on the screen of where the cursor is. And it goes and tells Chrome. Chrome tells the DOM, and the DOM digs down and finally figures out which component it was that has the click. That is the capture phase. The next phase is the bubble phase. This is the one that everyone thinks about. It goes the other way. Once I find where I'm at, I begin to go up through that ownership hierarchy until I get to the top of the page or I'm stopped. When I stop, that node that stopped me is defined as the root node in Lightning Framework. 
All right? The last phase is the default phase. This is the difference between component and application events, is if that prevent default is true or false. What happens here is from that root node we identified in the first two phases, it publishes to all of the children and says, hey, by the way, this event occurred. I no longer have to dig through all the layers of hierarchy. All I know is I heard the event, I'm closing. Let's see how that works. Here, I have to add an additional handler. I'm adding this handler on a specific phase, on the bubble phase. The default for application events is actually the default phase. Um, so you have to specifically define and say, listen on the bubble. And the, just a single line, stop the propagation. Now it's going to capture that, stop it, and publish back down. All right. So we've seen how this works on these small components. Does this work at scale? Well, let's talk about some principles with this. And that principle is encapsulation. Encapsulation is the idea that I want to be a good citizen. A good citizen doesn't just leave it all hanging out on the street. We want to present a nice face to, the, to others in the community. We present appropriate attributes. So the scope of my variables in my input component. I don't publish my results list. I don't publish what I'm actively searching. I only publish my value, because that's all that the rest of the world needs to know. Second one, methods. You can use methods to, to reduce coupling. Coupling is a concept where I have to know a lot about another component in order to interact with it. Using methods simplifies that and gives me a nice clean interface or a clean doorway to get into and out of that component. Now, one word of caution. In order to use a method, I have to know that the other person exists. I can't open a door without knowing that the door is there. So that's why, even though methods are a good improvement, events are, tend to be preferred inside of Lightning for specific purposes. All right? What happens with an event is I'm just broadcasting a message saying, anyone that can hear me, make sure to do this. I don't have to know that door exists. I just say, every door, open. Wouldn't that be nice? Last key to that event is make sure you're being a good citizen and encapsulating your private events. Events that the rest of the world doesn't really need to know about. You can treat it similar to how you do when you do your Apex handling, where you capture a specific error or exception and republish a more general one. Do the same thing with your events. Capture your specific events, republish a more general event. All right. The last thing is to plan for performance. If you follow every best practice we've talked about today, and every best practice that you're taught here at Dreamforce, you're going to end up with some components that are really, really non-performant. Trust me, I built them. I built a table component that took forever to render because every cell was its own component. And when you get 400 rows by 20 columns, that's a lot of components. So remember that the guideline with these best practices, the young developer knows the rules, but the experienced developer knows the exceptions. What we've talked today about are the rules. Go out, practice this. You can download the um, Git repo, look at my components, go out with your own components, practice, experiment, and get to know what those exceptions are so that we can build some really awesome components for our community and for our environment. All right, there's that repo um, in case you need it. And uh, I'd like to say thank you for all of you for spending a few minutes with me this afternoon. Don't forget to do the surveys. And I believe the next slide is the, uh, the developer keynote, which is coming up. So I'll be available for questions here on the side if anyone has any. I'd like to thank you again, and have a happy Dreamforce.